Well, I guess a lot of you are surprised to see me back online so quickly. Um, yes, I was very ill for a very uh, short period of time. And um, thanks to your prayers and uh, thanks to some antivirals and prednisone and a few other things that my doctor um, prescribed for me, I'm actually recovering pretty, very quickly. At least I feel a lot better today than I felt yesterday. I spent a uh, couple of days just kind of flat on my back sleeping and not really being able to do anything. So I am thankful for the prayers and I pray that I'll continue to recover and I won't overdo it. So I began to slide back. That's kind of my default. I tend to feel it better and so I kind of overdo it and then I get exhausted and the cycle starts again. So you can pray for me in that regard as well. But I, I hate d missing these opportunities because I know that this interaction that we have on a daily basis is a pretty important part of a lot of your life. Uh, not that I'm so special, but it seems like God is faithful to use the few things that I share to encourage and strengthen and help build you up in the faith. Well, anyway, we left off uh, on Monday uh, where I was talking about um, uh, Paul's instructions to men. He said, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger, uh, without disputing. And uh, basically, he said, without ending up getting into verbal altercations. And uh, you really need to remind, I guess, kind of clarify, why is Paul making these statements? Why is he, what is he attempting to say? Well, he, it was in chapter three further on, and we'll get there uh, sometime in the future, but it was in chapter three, verse 13, that Paul explained his reason behind the entire letter. He said, so that you will know, the people will know how they ought to uh, conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So in other words, Paul was writing this letter to Timothy in 1 Timothy to help him to have a foundation for structuring the church services. I mean, this was something you have to realize was completely new. When you look at the cultural context, especially of a town like Ephesus, but it was true of almost all the Greek cities, um, they were pretty wild places. I mean, they would have these uh, festivals and the festivals were oftentimes degenerated into drunkenness and uh, gluttony and, and even uh, fornication, adultery, and all sorts of wild and perverse behavior. And so they were pretty wild, crazy things. And the, this is all people knew before this time. I mean, it wasn't like they had been raised in a, a quaint little church and a little chapel in the countryside where people understood how to uh, behave in that kind of setting. The idea of coming together as a community of believers, sitting under the teaching of the word and worshiping together in a calm and, and a form of decorum was something completely new to them. And so that's why Paul begins to lay out these things. Now, it's important, I think, to point this out because sometimes in reading this, particularly this part, last part of chapter two, there a lot of people who lead the, read the passage very literally, but they don't understand really the context behind it, and they end up taking some pretty, well, unreasonable and extreme positions. So that what we, again, we need to keep in mind is Paul said the very first thing he says is the men who are supposed to be providing the theological and spiritual leadership within the church, he said, you know, the church service is not for you to show off. It's not for you to puff your chest or be combative or argumentative or to prove what, how smart you are. And in other words, it was this place of debate and argumentation because in the Greek world, when people gathered, that was often the case. They came together and they debated and they argued and they went back and forth because there was no central authority. But in the church, you have a central authority. It's called the Word of God. And so what we're all supposed to do is to read and to know and to understand the Word of God and then let its truths guide our conversation. And when we do that, then the conversation can be edifying. And it's also one of the reasons why Paul repeatedly warned about false doctrine, not unsound doctrine, where he said there were people who were trying to introduce teachings that he, in fact, called doctrines of demons that would lead people away from a simple faith into some kind of complex, abstract way of living their life, or <clears throat> more commonly, into some form of works and legalisms by which they would seek to save themselves by doing their best effort. So all of this to say he's instructing first and foremost the men in the church, it's your job to first submit yourself to the word of God. And if there's discussion, conversation, and inquiry, then it's supposed to be about how do I apply that to my life? What does that mean? And what does it mean to my life so that I can live out my Christian life? It's not a place for debate or controversy. And secondly, he turns to the ladies and this is where he begins, first of all, to talk about the way that women dress in the church service. He says, likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, 
not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. Now, here again, you find that some groups have gotten so uh, literal in this that they basically forbid women to wear any kind of jewelry, not even wedding rings. Um, and <laughs> I remember I was uh, in, involved with a group one time where they, nobody wore a wedding ring, but everybody had a watch. And they were really nice watches. <laughs> and so it was always kind of funny to me. But the idea was that they had defined within our cultural setting what that meant. And so uh, they had very expensive suits and ties and they looked really sharp and well-dressed and had expensive watches, but didn't have a ring, didn't have any jewelry. The women didn't have any earrings. Um, you know, it, as if that was really the point. And I don't believe that's at all what the point means. In fact, I think Billy Graham put it what best when he said that people should dress as the world dresses, but not as it undresses. In other words, if we wear garments that are, you know, something from the 17th century, as some groups do, we're going to stand out. People are going to look at us just because we're odd in our appearance. And so we're not trying to, to prove that we are spiritual because we're odd in how we dress. At the same time, he says, it's all right to dress in a fashionable manner to wear what people are wearing. But he said the line is that when you begin to undress, when you begin to use it in a sexually stimulating and sexually suggestive way, and we, you know, I don't have to go into too much detail to explain that. We can simply turn on the TV now and see all sorts of examples of that uh, being displayed within our homes. But the whole point is that there's a decorum, he said, that women should have. That it isn't, when they come to church, they shouldn't be seeking to draw attention to themselves, but they should be seeking to draw close to God and help others focus on the Lord. And that's just a personal responsibility we have when we come together in fellowship. And he says, instead of that, instead of having this dressing in a way that makes everybody stare at us and look at us and take note of us, he says, rather it should be by means of good works as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. So here again, what's really the central issue here is that what should be distinctive about a woman is that her life is committed to living in a godly way. And if she is living in a godly way, it's going to manifest itself in good works. There's going to be charity, there's going to be kindness, there's going to be ministry to others and caring for others. And so instead of reducing this into some kind of uh, legalistic way of saying you can wear this, but you can't wear that, and your collar has to be this way, and you have to do that, and your hair can only be this style, uh, rather than getting caught up in all of that, we need to realize that we should dress appropriately. And how do you define, define appropriately? Well, it depends on the culture you're in. There are actually, you know, uh, cultures where uh, some things that we might consider inappropriate are very appropriate. And so it's one of those kind of things that it's situational in that sense. But the issue is, is that you're not trying to draw attention to yourself, but you're trying to draw attention or let people's attention go towards the Lord. I know that my pastor used to always point out that he said that, that he, one of the things he objected to about people who would stand up and prophesy in the middle of a service or who would get up and start dancing and waving, you know, he said all they're trying to do is draw attention to themselves. They're just basically exhibitionists. And he said, <laughs> I know one, one guy put it really well one time when somebody stood up and began speaking in tongues and he himself was a Pentecostal preacher. He said, Madam, the Holy Spirit doesn't interrupt himself. And he made her shut up. The whole point is that when we come to church, it's not about getting people to focus on us. It's seeking to put our focus on the Lord and encouraging others by the way that we live and the way we act to do the same. So that when people leave the service, they're not thinking about, look how she was dressed, look how he was dressed, or look what kind of shoes or hat or whatever this guy has on. But it's based upon what we heard from God, how God spoke to us. You and I have the responsibility to be mindful of that. But basically, that's one of the reasons why I don't really believe in any kind of a, or you know, special dressing. I tell people, come to church the way you dress every day. If that's the way, you, if you're comfortable with that, come to church the way you dress every day. Don't feel like you have to uh, dress up or dress down. Just wear what is your normal garb, and and that's good enough. There's nothing else to get excited about. So anyway, hope that was clear. I'm not sure right at this point how clear all my thoughts are, but I appreciate your patience and uh, look forward to continuing this on as we uh, get into the week. God bless you and go in His grace.